I don't normally do this, but I'd prefer it if those who view this upload have seen the film in question. It is worth paying money for, and if you pay for a copy of any film featured on FOTD, please let it be this one. Not only will I spoil the film's narrative circumstances, and not only does this film need to be seen by as many people as possible, and I mean that, it's that I couldn't help but write this piece for an audience who has seen this film in question. I saw enough reviews online not proclaiming this film as a near peerless masterpiece, so now I simply must direct any subsequent white write-up at addressing such utter hubris. So with all that ado, let's get on with the piece. I'm going to explain how I feel sometimes, which isn't the same as me stating what I necessarily feel to be objectively correct. I don't know whether to forgive others, sometimes. I feel as though I must have no self-respect to let certain others retain my company. Truly these people are deep down sick and demented. They might find the death of a third party's beloved animal amusing because of suppressed 4chan nostalgia. Or maybe they pride themselves on manipulating others, on maintaining a social image built on lies, on deception, because to them all that matters is what select others know, not what is or what has happened. To these people, the universe is chaos, and thank God for that. Their actions have no consequences, and they couldn't be happier. My friend A almost convinces me that someone who has committed a truly heinous crime, one so significant that they cannot ignore, cannot chemically ignore, except in cases of severe neurological defection, the consequences of their actions, has greater capacity for redemption, can or could have a greater moral understanding and awareness of their actions, of where their male ego, let's say, sits in the schemata of human personalities, than those who might commit traditionally less serious crimes, offences or trespasses. Is this truly the case? My friend A makes me feel, not necessarily believe, this, especially in how it evokes one's real world. There are characters in My Friend A who have committed less traditionally awful actions than Suzuki, who have, frankly, less redemptive qualities than him. The obvious example might be Fujisawa's abuser, but also to Masuda and Suzuki's two roommates, who casually watch and laugh about a video recording of her rape. We can go into Masuda himself, whose adolescent self had less excuses for enabling a peer's suicide than the extremely su abused Suzuki had for committing a homicide. So what am I trying to say exactly? I'm trying to say that the fact that Masuda can consider Suzuki a friend, despite the actions of his past, it's not dependent on whether that crime in and of itself is unforgivable, but whether the individual in question is worth forgiving. A crime committed does not define a person, although how they feel about that committed crime could. I despise general rudeness in people. I don't mean, well, acting opinionated on a YouTube vlog, as one could perhaps accuse me of, fairly. But just getting an endorphin rush out of being nasty to people in the real world, I consider this to be disgusting behaviour. This might seem obvious to anyone who isn't overweight or regrets having any children, but to those of the millennial and somewhat Gen Z milieu, I'm born 96 so I'm torn between both, acting rude and standoffish and bullying toward others is in vogue. Given what social media is, a monolithic catalogue of perceived popularity, People have been terrified into behaving as though it is the conformist picket fence 1950s once again and everyone is terrified to do anything that might be considered out of step or lame or gay or whatever. Not cool, I suppose. Whatever that might means depending on the month. So as a result, acting polite and kind or nice is considered lame and gay by most young guys and for those few girls who can get away with it without becoming socially isolated. It rooted in 4chan disdain for others' happiness, which became the model for the 2010's Twitter intelligentsia abuse cycle, somethingawful.com was the model for the future. And so, what am I getting at? Something, anything, I hope. No, seriously, I'm trying to put contemporary rudeness of my peers in perspective. Is it warranted? No. Is it forgivable? Well, how do they feel about it? They don't care. As long as they get what they assume they need socially, they'll drown countless newborns. Wouldn't phase them. Suzuki com came across as a character whom I would sooner be inclined to forgive for their actions than the abject sociopathic pack mentality inspired rudeness of certain alleged friends and their actions against or considering others, not even against myself. I think that that is the saddest thing of all about my friend A. It demonstrates and reminds one of the casual evil omnipresent in our contemporary society and culture. On a macro level, the sadistic media machine, at a micro level, the bullying cruelty of Suzuki and Masuda's roommates, and on a personal familial level, the vaguely narcissistic arrogance of Shiraishi's mother. 
Maybe it is that human beings are only capable of feeling remorse once it is too late, and until then they do not truly care about the negative consequences of their actions on others, only how it affects themselves. Though even Suzuki, a murderer, is not convinced he, true, he feels true remorse by virtue of the fact that he would rather live than die. Again, it isn't that Suzuki is just so overwhelmingly remorseful for his actions that we cannot help but forgive him. In fact, not only is Suzuki not the only character in the story consumed by guilt at actions of the past, but Suzuki is not the only grown-up child killer in this narrative. A highly powerful parallel subplot concerns a father, Yamauchi Shuji, who has not forgiven his adult son for atrocious consequences of his behaviour when he was a child. Shuji has not forgiven himself, and especially not his son, for the responsibility of diseased children, though the son has chosen to move on, and is engaged to be married to a woman who loves him despite knowing of his history. Once again, it isn't that Suzuki is just so overwhelmingly remorseful for his actions that we cannot help but forgive him. It doesn't make us like the guilt-ridden Shuji anymore. It is that he, and the other, Shuji's son Yuzai, feels remorse at all, and have tried so much harder, harder than any of the other ugly creatures in this film's storyline, to preclude the possibility that they might cause harm or bring upset to anyone else ever again. Somehow, perhaps it is just such a potent sincerity, it becomes easier to imagine these killers living the rest of their lives without harming another living creature, physically or emotionally, than it is even for Masuda. Masuda comes across as redeemable as Suzuki, although not nearly as remorseful, and not as determined to never cause any harm ever again. Suzuki's deep-seated belief that he doesn't deserve to be forgiven, or Yuzai's acceptance that others might never forgive him, come across as nobler and more selfless than Masuda's apparent belief that he is either redeemable or more redeemable on a spectrum which might render Suzuki irredeemable. But more importantly than one's ability to feel remorse, or if they consider themselves redeemable, is that a character like Suzuki became able to forgive others their trespasses, knowing, tragically, how easy it is to empower an ugly impulse. It is one thing to try and prevent oneself from mistreating others in any capacity. I could certainly be capable of that. Who isn't? Who isn't? But forgiving others over what they have done to me? I can only speak for myself, but I find that to be so ruthlessly difficult. This too saddens me about the experience, the achievement, of my friend A. On the positive side, I cannot help but feel some degree of uplift when I view a film which could be, and is at least a reasonable candidate for, the greatest film ever made. I see some comments on this film online and they give it, you know, like a 7 out of 10 or a 3.5 out of 5 and it's like, you don't get it. Technically, aesthetically, this is the peak of film art thus far. I mean, kind of, right? Don't deny it because you feel intimidated by thinking for yourself. Just because that observation isn't an established consensus yet doesn't mean that it isn't true. I haven't read the novel which this film is based off of, Yuzai by Gaku Yakumaru, although it quite evidently contains such powerful ideas, and director Takahisa Zeiza, an incomparable genius of film art to anyone who knows especially his recent work well, apparently composed the finest film screenplay, maybe ever, in order to translate this novel into his medium. Together with cinematographer Atsuhiro Nabashima, Takahisa Zeiza composes the finest film of the 2010s, off the top of my head, anyway. This film is superbly composed, expertly framed and edited together. Each shot is considered in the narrative vector as though it was storyboarded to be the greatest narrative feature ever made. Insofar as My Friend Day is a film, like perhaps any film, which it seeks to explain the emotional significance of its final shot, it is the most considered I've ever seen. I rarely have seen a film where in every frame felt so purposeful, so relevant within the plot, and in justifying each moment within the context of its wider narrative, it becomes so communicatively filmic so as to justify the medium's existence and, yes, superior to its, in this case, in this story's case, literary roots. Even just from a technical perspective, I consider My Friend A one of the most absolutely impressive films ever made, and then with its narrative prowess on top of that, it makes an even shorter list of most impressive films, and also steps forth as a candidate for the most emotionally moving ever made. I recommend that Asian film Pulse and Panos Kotzafanasis be removed from the internet for claiming My Friend A had the chance to be a great film, but a number of issues in the narrative forbade it from doing so. What rules did it break? 
What rules exist? Who thinks like that? How do you live with yourself? Stop watching films, or at least stop trying to write about them. That is so repulsive. What passes for film criticism on, on the internet is just absolutely embarrassing. Uh, to be fair, some of what passed for internet criticism before the internet was pretty bad too. Yeah. Anyone who doesn't care for this film would probably have done what Masuda did. Join in with a bullying pack in order to fit in, even if it enabled a suicide, and relished in the deception that they were the victim's only friend. Even my closest friends could be this kind of person, to be honest. Maybe having any human connections at all is a mistake I ought to rectify. Not out of fear of others trespassing against me, but of how I might trespass against them. It might be that a fear of any subsequent guilt over cruel behaviour could prevent our species from enacting it out more so. But anyway, my friend A is possibly the greatest film I've ever seen. And you know what? Maybe it's time to become a hermit. Yeah. Hermit life for me. I just hate people so much, and my friend A just reminds me of that. It's like, I don't know any good people, other than my parents, I suppose. Like, everyone is just horrendous. Horrendous. Just narcissistic and evil.